All right, so we're in the crypto stage, and we might not say very nice things about crypto, so we're preparing oh, we're for. Say nice All things. right, so let's start from the beginning. Sure. How did you guys get interested in crypto? Sure, uh, I have a degree in economics, um, and uh, a friend of mine from from college, uh, probably about 15 years ago, gave me the worst financial advice of my life. Um, he he told me about this new stock, uh, this company. Uh, well, had it developed synthetic blood, and it was going to change everything, and I needed to invest. Yeah, I needed to invest. <laughs> uh -oh. he'd, he'd heard about it at a wedding. And um, so I put a little money into it. I promptly lost it. It was probably a, a penny stock pump and dump. Anyway, my, and so I avoided stocks ever since. And, um, and he came back to me in 2021, and he said I needed to buy Bitcoin. And I, I, I thought, okay, I think there might be something that I need to, to check out here. So. Um, you know, I have this degree in economics, and I just I went down a rabbit hole. Um, I reached out to Jacob last year to um, to come up with this crazy idea of writing a book about crypto and fraud. And um, we've been traveling around the the world, you know, reporting on what's going on. And Jacob, did you were you looking at crypto before or no? I, I was. Um, I, I've been writing about tech for about 12 years or so, and. You know, generally from a critical perspective, uh, I wrote a book about social media and that came out in 2015. And, you know, tech companies have a lot of power in this world. And I sort of, I saw crypto as the, the new iteration, the new big thing in tech. And of course, a lot of the VCs who are behind what's called Web 2 now are now involved in Web 3. So I was writing about crypto a bit, and, but I wasn't really able to, to focus on it full time. And that's been one of the pleasures of this project is that now we've really been able to dive in and talk to people from all facets of the industry, from CEOs to low-level employees to people who have lost all their money. You know, uh, we're really, I think, getting a big picture view that when you're working at a publication and you and you have to do something different every day, you don't always get to do. Yeah. So, what is the big picture? What's the big takeaway so far sure. after, in your travels, in your interviews? Like, what is your overarching so, thought? So, the book is trying to. So, the book is is it's called Easy Money. Uh, it'll be out next summer. Uh, it's about crypto, but it's also about casino capitalism, which is the notion that we're sort of turning a lot of facets of our economy into, um, you know, casino-like uh, zero-sum games in economics, where you're not really creating value, you're, you're, you're basically gambling. Um, and, in, and the third thing it's about is the golden age of fraud, uh, which is a term coined by Jim Chanos, the legendary uh, short seller. But I do think there's a particularly large amount of fraud uh, uh, going on in, in the world. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, the pandemic and the easy money that was released into the, the system created opportunities for a lot of fraud. And so we're, we're trying to bring those things together, right? Crypto, casino capitalism, golden age of fraud. Um, and, and, and I think crypto is really interesting to study from that perspective. So. You mentioned crypto and gambling together. Do you guys think it's just about gambling in the end, or is there some utility? What have you seen? Utility? Uh, well, we went to El Salvador, which is the only country that's trying to use it as a currency. Um, n it's really not being used there. Uh, El Salvador's, the, the pitch from Bukele was that it was going to boost tourism, and you were going to be able to use it for remittances because the Salvadoran economy is heavily reliant on remittances. It's about a quarter of the economy. So um, if, that were, if the marketing pitch worked, it could be a game changer for the country. Uh, unfortunately, it hasn't. Uh, less than 2% of remittances are using the Chivo system that they set up. This is the government's old number, so I'm not, you can Google us. Um, it's not misinformation. Um, and tourism, you know, probably has gone up a little bit, but that's in comparison to the pandemic. So it's, I don't know, that's a very good. Um, so it really just hasn't taken off. Um, and there are some negative consequences as well. Um, we spoke to a guy who's gonna be kicked off his land. Uh, he lives in, um, most likely, he lives in the eastern part of the country where Bukele is saying he's going to build a Bitcoin mining geothermal mining operation at an airport, and this guy, Wilfredo, uh, you know, has lived on this land, he's a fisherman, and he's gonna be booted off to build an airport, theoretically. Okay. So there, these are not currencies. I mean, by any reasonable definition, economic definition, they, they don't work as a medium of exchange, a unit of account, or a store of value. They really don't. They, they really resemble securities. 
And so if we're going to talk about securities, then we need disclosure laws. We have securities laws. We've had them for a very long time for a reason. Um, and I think that will provide the investor protection that we need. That's, that's the other sort of main lens that we're looking at. It through, through, you know, most people who have invested in crypto have now lost money because most people entered last year um, at sort of the height or near the height. Um, and the polling bears this out, and you can do the research. Um, so, you know, it's a lot of people. It's tens of millions of Americans alone who've lost, you know, hope, many of them little, but some of them everything. Um, I, think we, I think that's worth discussing. So one of the standard arguments is it's like the early days of the internet. I've been hearing it since like the early days of crypto <laughs> as well, right? Like you were, you've covered tech for 12 years. It's not the early days of the internet, but it's slightly earlier than now. Like does that comparison make sense to you? No, um, <laughs> I, it doesn't hold for me. I mean, we're arguably 13 years into the crypto era, starting with the Bitcoin white paper. That's actually a fair amount of time in the tech world. I mean, you could say that the internet started in the 60s and 70s with the Pentagon, but you know, the, the, the mass adoption that was achieved in the 90s and the 2000s is far greater than what crypto seems to be on, on a path for. Um, the other thing that I see is, besides the lack of actual use cases and utility, is that every time we've talked to a computer scientist or a technologist or a software engineer who, who does not work in crypto, who has no financial interest in crypto, they tell us that blockchain is not a very efficient technology. I mean, it's widely known that Bitcoin ha allows about seven transactions per second. So that's why you have the Lightning Network and that's why we have side chains and L2s and things like that. But what you're really having then is they have to make up for the inherent incapacities of the blockchain, the fact that it's slow and, and these other sorts of features that don't really seem to to work for their intended use cases. So a lot of the innovation that I think we've seen in crypto in the last couple of years is actually trying to respond to those inherent problems with blockchain. Um, so I, I, we often say that um, crypto and blockchain are responding to some genuine issues in tech and in the economy. We do not like Wall Street. We are not paid by big banks. Uh, we don't really like the Fed very much either. But that doesn't mean that this is the right direction to go in necessarily. Right. And I think that's the mistake also that's often made in these debates and these arguments. There's assumed that there's only one alternative, uh, which is crypto and, and blockchain in order to sort of democratize the economy, redistribute wealth, things like that. I don't think there is only one alternative. What do you think? Because obviously the, the reason behind it at the beginning was to disintermediate the big banks. And we were talking about it backstage and it was after the crash. But you know now the big banks have come in and they're going to use blockchain for all sorts of things. Some of them are started doing crypto trading, crypto custody. Like, wh why do you think like, that is? And like, you know, does that, does that, you know, have you seen the people you're speaking to in crypto, do they seem happy of it or not? Because that seems like counterintuitive to their original ethos, <laughs> to right? The, to the, the yeah. peer-to-peer currency that Wall Street's entered at the, 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 the yeah. chat. Uh, yeah, that seems a bit uh, hypocritical. Um, you know, Wall Street's there to make money. That's what Wall Street does. Uh, so some of that's providing services to their clients, right? They're just, your clients want to trade it. Here, we'll, we'll, we'll take our cut. Um, there's a lot of hype about Wall Street getting involved. A lot of times that hype is not, you know, they're exploring it, they're considering it. They're, you know, let's see. Um, I, I, is my worry, just stepping out uh, a bit, widening the lens a touch, is that if Wall Street, or banking really, if the banking industry gets too involved in cryptocurrency, too embedded, I, I worry about the inherent um, rigidity of the crypto ecosystem um, and the leverage employed. These have all the hallmarks of what created the subprime crisis, right? The, the over leverage and the rigidity in that system, w w those are two of the primary causes of the subprime crisis. So I do worry that, that that's a risk. Hillary Allen, uh, a professor at American University, has written a paper about this. It's quite good um, that I recommend to anyone who's, who's interested in the parallels between DeFi and, um, and subprime. So let's, let's see where it goes. But, um, but uh, uh, it, as the easy money system has gone, uh, the easy money era has ended here and the Fed has raised interest rates, we'll, we'll see what survives in a year or two. So I've seen lots of crypto like booms and busts. So, you know, I'm like trying to figure out like what will be the next cause of this next boom. Uh, but I've also seen that when it crashes, like oftentimes at the beginning, like the victims were 
often, if you can call them victims, or people that lost money, they were like, uh, have you noticed like a change now in the sense that it became so mainstream the other time? You know, yeah. there were tons of celebrities endorsing it. You could buy it on Cash App. You could buy it on PayPal. You, like, literally anyone in the U.S. could just easily buy mm -hmm. crypto. Like, has that made it like, had made the impact a lot more like mainstream too? Yeah, I, I think that's certainly changed who's involved in crypto and who's losing money. I mean, we do see some of these people as victims because, for example, Binance promoted uh, Terra. And it, there was an ad that Binance put around for a lot of time. It said risk-free. Um, so if you're constantly bar a barrage with ads, you're just an average retail trader, and people are telling you this is risk-free, celebrities are telling you this is the future, I don't think you should... I mean, there's, there's such an individualist DYOR culture in, in crypto, but you know, if an average retail trader loses money because everyone around them told them this was a wise investment, I don't really blame the average retail trader. I think what's also different now from, say, the ICO boom and bust of 2017, 2018, is that you do have more retail traders losing money. And you know, in the past, when there, there have been these busts, people say, oh, it's cyclical and things like that. But also, they're losing other people's money. You know, like we, 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 We've talked to people who say, oh, I lost a billion dollars or something like that. Well, one, that was paper money, didn't, you weren't cashing out yet. But two, also, you lost venture capitalist money or you lost institutional investors' money. But we talked to people who lost you know, their entire life savings, and that might just be $25,000, it might be $1,000. So what is, um, you know, what is really a problem for someone in terms of how much money they lost really depends on their class and economic condition. Uh, and I also think, just to sort of wrap that up, what you now see is, first, we had uh, trading volume, retail trading volume uh, boom last year when the market was running hot. And then now that a lot of people, frankly, have lost their money, you have trading volumes are way down. Um, you know, a Coinbase released its financials yesterday, lost $545 million in last quarter. They said that a lot of trading was moving overseas. But also, it's just there are fewer people in the casino. And I think that some people in the public are either wising up or, you know, they realize this is speculation largely and gambling and maybe they don't have enough money to come back to the casino again. What did you find from the people you were speaking to, like regular folks who lost money, that they were burned, that they're going to come back? Like I remember reading the Celsius letters and some were quite, you know, heartbreaking in a way because people were saying I lost 25,000 pounds or dollars, sorry, it might not be much, but for me it was like whatever and I'm humiliated. So, yeah. you know, because... I found sometimes you speak to people about crypto and some of them will tend to hold, but if, if you're a regular person, you might not be able to hold. You, you, you right. might need to sell at the bottom. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's quite traumatic to lose a, uh, a lot of money. We were talking to uh, some folks who run an addiction center. I mean, they're, we were talking to them about gambling addiction. And they've, they've, they've treated, um, it's a smaller practice, but they've, they've recently treated a lot more people. Um, and it's often men, you know, crypto is, is, is much more, it's about two and a half to one male to female, according to the Pew study. It's younger men, 42% um, of 18 to 29 year old men have bought, sold, traded crypto. When, when you win, you feel euphoric. When you lose, it's extremely, um, it, it can be very traumatic. Um, unfortunately, suicide is a, is, is a big issue. Um, uh, with gambling addiction, suicide rates are much higher than other addictions, uh, which is something I did not know until speaking to them. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to talk about such a negative thing, but, but, but that is how bad it can get. And we have, we, unfortunately, we are you know, talking to people, who, and, and that creates generational issues, right? Because someone loses their life savings and kills themselves, that has a massive effect on obviously not just them, but on you know, all sorts of other people. Now, are people defrauded in other businesses and other? Sure, of course. And, and, and I'm not here to, to say crypto is unique in that regard, but because it does resemble gambling, you know, we, we have gambling laws for a reason. Um, we should have laws similarly here and disclosures and things like yeah. that. And, and just to add to that, I think a great example is Celsius. A lot of everyday people put their money into Celsius because um, Alex Mashinsky told them it was a safe place for their money and they would get these high yields. And through the, the bankruptcy process that Celsius is now in, there have been thousands of testimonials that were submitted to the court by regular people who trusted the company and now they can't get their money out. And these are not people who 
thought of themselves as reckless gamblers. They thought, right. this is how I, I'm going to eventually pay for my retirement or for a family member's surgery or something like that. I mean, these are really everyday consumers. And if crypto wants to be a mass adoption sort of medium or tool, it has to find a way to protect those people. And right now you have hundreds of thousands of victims of Celsius, and a lot of them are these everyday people who are not getting that money back. Were regulators sleeping on the job? Because we do have rules, right? And yeah. it's not the first crypto crash. And some stuff was somewhat predictable, right? Like, how are you offering these high yields with no, like, you know, it's clearly risky. Like, why are you letting someone advertise and say it's not, so? Yeah, I mean, I think it really points to some, some systemic flaws, um, you know, uh, they, the United States is the only country in the world, as far as I'm aware, that separates its commodities regulation from its securities regulation. I think that's provided uh, a window for crypto to sort of get embedded into the system. But I don't think that we should let regulators off. I think that there's a lot of blame to go around. And quite frankly, the blame falls on both parties. You know, this is not a, an issue where you can just go, oh, you know, it's only the Republicans' fault, or only the Democrats' fault, or whatever. Um, a lot of what happens is that money gets involved and a, and a, and a, and a revolving door forms, you know, mm -hmm. where hundreds, literally a study was done, hundreds of people have gone from government to the private sector, sometimes private sector to government and back again, um, from crypto. You know, so they're like regulating the industry that, and they, and they want to get the gig afterwards that's gonna pay them a lot more money <laughs> than their regulated gig. I'm sorry, that's, that's the that's God's honest truth. Um, so we need to enforce securities laws or commodities laws or any laws, but we do need to enforce them. Yeah. And, and, they, and they have dropped. They have dropped the ball. I think also the virtue of regulation, uh, such as it is, I mean, it's, not, it's certainly far from a perfect sort of framework, but if you do believe in crypto, as a lot of people tell us, that, that you would probably want the bad actors to be flushed out of the system. And we hear all the time from executives, oh, 90 or 99% of this industry is junk, there are a lot of scams, but you know, my project's good. Well, you shouldn't stand for that if you really believe in this industry. And like, for example, the, the exchanges are mostly overseas, they're filled with wash trading. Some of them are arguably rigged um, you know, by market makers and other insiders. So if you do want a successful crypto industry that can achieve mass adoption, you need fair markets. You, for people to compete in. You need a little bit of consumer protection regulation so that when something goes wrong, there's some sort of remedy. And you know, of course, crypto has some, has some libertarian and anti-status kind of origins. But again, you know, most people out there are not libertarians who, who don't want any state involvement in their lives. I think a lot of people prefer, if they're going to buy crypto, to know that they're entering a fair market. And right now, those markets aren't fair. So where do you think we go from here for the last 30 seconds? A very big question. Do we sure. go, you know, is it going to go away? Is it, is it slowly going to go away because more chips, chips are going to fall? Or is it, you know, um, you know, is there going to be the next big thing that makes another bubble explode? Well, so, so crypto has only ever known easy money, right? It was birthed in 08. Interest rates uh, up until, you know, this year have been extremely low by historical standards. The Fed is going to have to continue to raise interest rates. So. How long will this crypto winter last? I don't know, but, the, but we are entering uncharted territory in terms of crypto. I think people need to be aware of that. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.